The environmental movement has many heroes. One stands out for his ability to understand issues from all angles and relate them to a broader audience as well as his huge record of accomplishment. As the first coordinator and executive director of Earth Day and the founder of the Earth Day Network, active in 180, 180, 180 nations, as head, as head of the Solar Energy Research Institute and, and President Carter's administration, as the first CEO and chair of Green Seal, and now as president of Bullet Foundation, this person has contributed on multiple fronts, indeed, over many decades to raise people's awareness about the environment, foregoing more sustainable sustainable paths for our society. And that is the truth. Uh, one person I will say that my husband said that changed his life was Earth Day, mm -hmm. 1970, and who started that. So, no wonder that in 1999, it was he was named Time Magazine Hero of the Planet. My colleague and friend, Dennis Hayes. for that uh, over-the-top introduction. For the first 30 seconds going in, I was wondering who Rochelle had confused me with. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. It's always nice to come to Washington, but it's especially nice in the fall. The air is brisk. The leaves are turning color. The squirrels are gathering the nuts off the White House lawn, a job that used to be done by the Secret Service. <laughs> were substantially longer than the amount of time they gave me to say it. But I'm supposed to be discussing the roots and evolution of the modern environmental movement, uh, how it evolved into the creation and the development of Green Seal, give a quick overview of green consumption today, and maybe a few words about the super green building that I built in Seattle, uh, talk a little bit about the major threats that are currently facing the planet, and round up with a profound set of insights that are optimistic going forward. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess out of homage to Bill Nye, if there's any of my 10 minutes left over, I'm supposed to solve Fairmont's last theorem. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to be pushing as hard as I can, but this is obviously going to be kind of a light treatment of a great many things. First Earth Day. The first Earth Day was in 1970, and one cogent thing about that that's often forgotten is that 1970 was coming out of 1960s. Those were the most extraordinary decade, certainly of my lifetime, one of the most extraordinary in the history of the planet. We've largely forgotten it. We see these scenes now in Hong Kong. Those were commonplace in the United States. It, it, it looked like Cairo rather frequently. Um, we had the Civil Rights Movement, we had the Anti-War Movement, we had the beginnings of the Feminist Movement, had the environmental movement. On the second date I had with the woman who was eventually to become my wife, we were really badly tear gassed at the Lafayette Park. When I asked her out for a third date that she accepted, it simply had hopes for the relationship. <laughs> It, 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 it's, it's hard to remember all of those things then, the, the riots on campus, the armed students seizing buildings. It, there, there's a story that captures it all. It's apocryphal, but it, it, it really does capture the essence of the period. It's a guy who decides to become a mailman. Goes down and is filling out all the forms of the post office, comes to the question, do you favor the overthrow of the United States government by force revolution for violence? He assumed it was a multiple choice, circle revolution. <laughs> Earth Day, which while uh, those things were kind of tearing America apart, Earth Day was trying to pull us all together around a series of things that, that gave us some common ground. In those days, if you were breathing in Los Angeles, it was the equivalent of smoking a couple packs of cigarettes a day. If you're a smoker, you're choosing to smoke. If you're a six-month-old infant, you're not choosing to breathe, and yet the consequences were pretty much the same. We had rivers catching on fire, the Great Lakes were dying, the bald eagle was deeply threatened as endangered species. 
And, and one can go on and on, but not in 10 minutes. In the wake of that, we turned out 20 million people, by far the largest planned demonstration, probably in the history of the world, certainly in the history of the United States. New York by itself had a million people who filled up the Great Lawn of Central Park and spilled on down Fifth Avenue for farther than the eye could see, even from the top of the derrick. And out of all of that came a, a political will express that fall in the Dirty Dozen campaign, and which, which knocked out seven incumbents on a total budget of $50,000, sent a shot that was heard across Capitol Hill and created the context within which a wave of legislation, a tsunami of legislation, changed the way that America was doing business. Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, Forest Protection Act, the Environmental Education Act, NEPA, I and mean, on and on and on. In four years, we probably changed the nature of American society as much as did the New Deal. Trillions and trillions of dollars were spent differently as a consequence of that period. And the world is a healthier, safer place, and because of the tests that were put on each of those pieces of legislation, we did it in a cost-effective way where the benefits always were multiple of the costs. Fast forward, 1990. We got pretty much all the laws that we wanted. We had to make some refinements in them. Um, and, and, and that was in the nature of the thing. They were brand new, and we went into it experimentally, recognizing that you'd have to be making some changes. By 1990, there was a strong sense that there were things that laws and regulations simply couldn't reach. Uh, you're not going to have a law that, that says that, that the Begley's and the Nye's are going to be having super efficient, lead built residences. So if we're going to be getting there, it's going to be a voluntary action by people. You're not going to probably have a law that says that, I hope we're never going to have a law that says you have to recycle lint, but, but <laughs> require you to lead lives of, of increasing sustainability. Um, one of the things that the EPA produced at that point was a, a study that said that. Americans who changed their own motor oil and poured their used motor oil down the nearest storm sewer were putting into the nation's wetlands the equivalent every year of 12 Exxon Valdezes. Mm -hmm. That been against the law forever. But you can't have somebody stationed at every single storm sewer entering the country. So you had to get people to change voluntarily a whole bunch of things about what they were doing. And that led to more efficient light bulbs, more efficient appliances, more efficient automobiles of the great triumphs. Um, and pretty much across the board, we, we were trying to get people to do things that were profoundly different. There was a policy component. We, during that effort, worked with the National League of Cities and the uh, uh, National Conference of Mayors to pass curbside recycling ordinances. So suddenly, oh, and, and at the same time, worked with the National Education Association to have recycling materials in all of the schools of the country. So we're unleashing 40 million little green gorillas to go home, <laughs> at precisely the time that their parents can really take it out to the curb. And their neighbors know whether they've taken it out to the curb. And suddenly, recycling just exploded across the United States. But again, it was something that was principally motivated by, by people and their own personal behavior. In that context, Green Seal was born. A lot of people wanted to buy green and uh, didn't know who to trust. There were all of these things on labels. Uh, my, my personal favorite has always been natural, which I guess means nothing at all, except it's not supernatural. <laughs> in, in, in that context, I should say that the organization was not greeted with people sprinkling rose petals down its path. There were trade associations that, that got deeply engaged uh, trying to crush it. And, they came pretty close. Uh, it's true that the Clinton administration set up the national, the federal ex environmental executive. She was supposed to be a running black force at, at that time. Didn't have any power at all. And I had to say that the Clinton administration, despite its executive orders, which were never enforced, treated us during that period with benign neglect. I frankly didn't think that the organization was likely to pull it off. And uh, I would, on subsequent visits to Washington, often have rides back to the airport with Arthur, we would talk about the latest set of things. That, and, and, and he was a profile in courage. We are all here tonight because Arthur Weisman simply, no matter what happened, 
wouldn't give up. Let me carry that just a little bit further. Arthur is a very good scientist. Arthur is a guy that had any number of jobs that were offered to him during this period. He's a guy who went without salary, he went without benefits relatively frequently through this period. He pulled people together, he kept the integrity of the organization above the board, and he kept himself with his eye on the goal. And to date, we now have a strong, vibrant organization that's getting stronger and more vibrant every year. So I'd be grateful if you would all get on your feet, put your hands together, and really give Arthur the answers. pretty much starting to come back to life, the bald eagle. I've got two bald eagle nests within 500 feet of my back door from all over the place. Um, and and a, a fair number of triumphs behind us. That's not to say that there are not truly formidable problems remaining, some of them relatively small. Just finished a book, I should put it out. My publisher would kill me if I didn't mention it. <laughs> It's the hidden impact of 93 million cows on America's health, environment, and culture, economy, politics, coming up next March. The American agricultural system has become increasingly vulnerable and unsustainable, and the American diets have become increasingly full of empty calories. And in many ways today, with our epidemic of obesity and of diabetes, uh, we're, we're in worse shape than we were in 1970. And then there are the big issues. You know that, that litany, I, this is another one hour speech by itself if I enter into the litany, but the one that is on everybody's mind at the moment is climate change. Where since the National Academy of Sciences first put out a fairly definitive report saying it was now time to start taking action. That was 1990. We've gone a quarter of a century with virtually nothing significant happening any place around the world. It is the most appalling and almost inconceivable uh, aspect of modern environmentalism that issue has not been addressed. So, in that context, I'm supposed to now move into the profound optimism. <laughs> <laughs> the, the things that are ahead of us, I, I, one, one more tweak before we get to the optimism, because we are in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I, I, I am I'm just appalled by what has happened to my government. The, the, the government that we have SEALs, including my son-in-law, who was a Navy SEAL out fighting for, has, has become utterly dysfunctional. We've got a Congress that cannot do anything. The close friend up for an appointment for a sub-cabinet position who was put on hold for 16 months before being confirmed unanimously. And it's just, and, and on three occasions, people came to that ceremony from other countries and were just shaking their heads saying, is this how you do it here? I, I think that the United States Congress may be the single strongest force against the spread of democracy around the world. Yeah. Yeah. In 1970, what we did was we went to Congress and we got them to pass a bunch of laws and we got an administration to appoint somebody like Bill Ruckelshaus, the Republican superb first EPA director, to get them implemented with sensible regulations. And, and we had a system where ground rules were being established for industry by government. I think fundamentally that's the way that it should operate. Today, it's not operating that way. And what we need to do instead is have industry and environmentalists working together to get out ahead of wherever government is or isn't going. There are a whole bunch of people in this room who understand the nature of the problems. In fact, the people in this room, for the most part, are people who, within your companies, have the responsibility for the sustainability portfolio. I mean, trust me, 90% of the seniors in America today would love to graduate and get your jobs. It's just, it's a perfect opportunity. 
You may not believe that every morning. <laughs> but at least in theory, that's true. Um, so I'm going to come up with two things that I'd like you to, to close with. One, and, and this may be just somebody who's rung a bell several times and wants to ring it one more time before it goes out, but I don't think so. We have, uh, speaking of celebrations, the 50th birthday, 50th anniversary of birthday coming up in 2020. Yeah, it, it makes it impossible for me to pretend that I'm not possibly slipping into middle age. My wife very carefully explaining to me that becoming a sexagenarian was not going to be anything like it sounds. <laughs> The 50th anniversary coming up in 2020, and we would love to work with all of you. We want to make that something that in the United States and around the world begins to do for the planet what 1970 did for the United States, build a consensus on a series of international issues. Climate to begin with, but problems of endangered species and endangered species trade, problems of the oceans, all of these things that transcend borders. I think it's possible in this age of new media and uh, social networking the whole digital world to build that kind of community. We don't really know what we're doing yet, but we're going to enlist a bunch of 14-year-olds who are going to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in, in 2015, we will be having a big event here on the Mall, focused mostly in Washington, D.C., upon problems of poverty in the environment. And, and, and poverty in general, this gigantic gap that is growing between the declining middle class, the poor, and the 1% of the 1%. So to the extent that any of you would care to be involved in that and work with us on that, please approach me or just call Earth Day Network or look at earthday.net. And I should also say that my good friend Trammell Crow is out in the audience here someplace. Um, and he runs an event that is totally unexpected, a spectacular Earth Day in Dallas, Texas, to the extent that any of you want to put a footprint in <laughs> Dallas. Uh, he, he, he assures me that if I come down there, I will not have to wear a bulletproof vest. But I, I, it, 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 he's really done a magnificent job of that, and he's always looking for people who are interested in partnering with him. The other, the more profound thing, though, that I wanted to leave with is this. An awful lot of people have jobs where they get up in the morning and they have to go to the office. And they wouldn't in a million years do that except they get paid to do it. And they have to get paid because that's how you keep your family fed. Uh, most of the people in this room get up every morning and go into work and do something that you find pretty fulfilling, something that you find pretty important. And that's an incredible treasure. Most of you are not CEOs. Most of you have to push your ideas up the ladder. Sometimes that's a little bit difficult to do. Um, and I guess what I wanted to say is this. In, in those occasions where you have to make a really, really tough decision, where there's something out there that you know is going to actually cost a little bit more, um, that it's going to be a little bit unpopular, that you think has real opportunities in the long run, but you're not sure what the impact will be on the quarterly returns or maybe even the annual returns, and you may not be surrounded by people who share all of your values and all of your enthusiasm. This is going to be tough. <clears throat> but when you get into those situations, that you will just do this. Step back from the fray for a couple of minutes. Think really hard about your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. Think, think about the humpback whales, the bald eagles. Uh, all the big classic values, the monarch butterfly with a brain that is so small that you can barely find it with the microscope, and it manages to migrate thousands of miles and land on the same tree generations after generations to keep it going, and is now in real trouble because the milkweed is not where it used to be, and millions and millions and millions are dying. Think, think about all of those things. And then, in that context, go back to your decision and ask yourself, what's the right thing to do? And then do it. Thank you.